The Beer Edu Podcast, Episode 93, Climate and Culture with Hans Apple. Welcome to the Beer EDU Podcast, the podcast for educators that love to learn and share ideas with fellow educators over beers, with your hosts, Kyle Anderson and Ben Dixon. Hey, Kyle, how are you doing, my friend? Doing all right. How about you, Ben? I am good. And hey, if we're together, this must be the Beer EDU Podcast, episode 093, and I am Ben Dixon. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at B Dixon NV. You, my friend. My name is Kyle Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at Anderson EdTech. Same thing for the Instagram. And then AndersonEdTech.net is my blog. I am also the author of To the Edge Successes and Failures Through Risk Taking. Learn more about that at toTheEdgeEDU.com. You can buy it on Amazon and Barnes and Noble through my publisher, EduMatch Publishing. And I may even have a handful of copies on hand that if you want to sign one, hit me up and we'll work something out. You could buy a copy right off of me, possibly. Awesome. Right on. So, hey, if this is the Beer EDU podcast, uh, I believe we have beers. What do yeah. you got, my friend? Yeah, it wouldn't be much of a Beer EDU podcast. Yeah. We did not have beer. So, hey, so I finally, um, you know, we are recording this a little out of order, uh, but yeah. um, I finally broke away from Austin brothers in Alpena, <laughs> Michigan. So I finally ran out of new ones uh, yeah. from them after my, uh, my suitcase stuffing that I did when I went back yes. there to my hometown there. So no, this time I got one that you're probably familiar with. It's a uh, 21st amendment yep. brewery out of San Francisco. Excellent oh, yeah. brewery. Uh, it is their brew free or die blood orange IPA. So I, I I'm a little surprised. I'd never had this one before. I have had the Brew Free or Die IPA, right. and then uh, my wife really likes the Hell or High Watermelon, yeah, uh, which is a good one as well. And then they make one, I cannot remember the name of it off the top of my head, but it's it's like Strawberry Pop-Tarts or something like that. It's a wheat oh, ale with strawberry yeah. or something. Right. That's really great. But this one's really good. It's um, 7% ABV, 70 IBU. When you crack it open, it's like this nice sweet orange on the nose. But then when you drink it, it's that bitter and pithy orange. Which, right. if you're going to do orange in the beer, I prefer that pithy one instead. Uh, you get a little bit of pine because it is a nice American IPA, a little slightly dry on the finish. I think the okay. orange really kind of brightens and lightens it up a little bit. And if this was the standard brew for your dye, which I haven't had in a while, I think that one finishes a little drier, but that orange really lightens it up. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's definitely one I've had, and it, it is a good one. It's it, that, is a, that is a tasty one. Yeah, my wife uh, at the grocery store one day did a little build a six pack and this was one of them right. she brought home. I'm like, oh, this is a good one. So I might have to get a handful more of those. So cool. you, on the other hand, have something I, yeah. pretty interesting. I So I went with, uh, I have, it's called Fieldwork Brewing. They're out of Berkeley, California. And I went with the Neutrino Bomb Double IPA. It's an 8.6 ABV, uh, no IBUs listed. I, I It's, it is to say this is citrusy would be an understatement. It is borderline like tart. Um, it's brewed with galaxy and Amarillo hops. It's, I mean, if you're, we're not, we're not broadcasting this live, but like this is crazy hazy. It's like, it looks like orange juice is what yeah, I, I, I was going to say. It looked like they basically like made orange juice, maybe threw some grapefruit juice in there yeah, and like turn it into beer. Yes. It, that's pretty much what it is. It's it's super, um, yeah, it's got a really heavy citrus taste, but a really good, pretty smooth finish, not not overpowering or anything like that. So, yeah, I mean, it's 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 one I've never had before. I picked up uh, some, uh, they have a place up in uh, Northern California, up in Napa that had, uh, they would do uh, growlers and they would do cans for you. So they had a brewery up there or, you know, basically an offshoot of their main brewery so yeah i picked up some up there and i might have a couple more to feature in the next few episodes very nice so well that being said we've yes. got beers we have a guest joining us that um, yes 
uh, I'll just get preview a little bit. We were talking before we hit the record button about uh, this gentleman was very excited to join us because this was his third <laughs> podcast of the day, yes. but he got to drink beer on this podcast. So he was pretty stoked about that. So, there we go. Well, let's welcome Hans Apple, Apple, excuse me, to the podcast. Hey, Hans. Yep. Hey, Hans. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. This is awesome. Uh, this is the yeah. way that podcast should be done, right? Like, come on. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. So, hey, hello, Hans, what are you drinking? So I've got an Ice Harbor Brewery IPA. Uh, okay. That's a local brewery for me. Uh, I live in Kennewick, Washington here. So um, decided to go local. This is a 6.8%, uh, uh, a little bit of citrus, floral, fruity. Uh, very tasty after a long day. <laughs> yeah, and especially in these times right now, I mean, we we got to have a beer every now and then at the end of a long there day we go. because it's uh, – it's hard, grueling work doing uh, what we do right now. But uh, <laughs> I, I will venture to guess, based on what you do for a living, that the hard, grueling work is tenfold compared to what I do because yeah. you are a middle school counselor. Wow, um, middle school is the best, man. Come on, <laughs> I, I love middle school kids. They're they're sweaty, smelly. Uh, they're like little kids and grown adults all in the same class period. Like they're just crazy, and it's awesome. They're, they're so much fun that, that there. I, and I know a lot of people who love middle school and I, I applaud all of you who, who do. I made it to sixth grade. I was like, that's good. Sixth grade was about good. I'm like seventh and eighth graders. I don't know. Kyle, Kyle, you had a little experience in that. I did six months as a middle school administrator. That was enough. And uh, yeah, just the, uh, there, there was a lot of reasons why I decided to go back to the classroom, but Middle school was part of the reason behind it. That was just not my vibe. So, you know, I like I like the high school crowd, and I I have a feeling I would like the elementary crowd as well. But yeah, the I like to joke around and say that middle school kids they're not even human because they're there's so much going on in their brains and their bodies at that point that like it's like they're an alien species from 20 light years away or something like that i think that's accurate i i think yeah you know people say you have to be a little weird to to hit it off with middle school kids and it's almost like we're sort of stuck in middle school like we never like <laughs> developed past that right. or something i'm still like a 13 year old so i still laugh at go. inappropriate jokes and I mean, come on, I'm drinking beer on a podcast. Is, uh, yeah, there we go. I feel like we're yeah. in middle school. <laughs> I, I, would, I, I agree with you on a, a certain <laughs> level with that because I like to, a, the, the inappropriate jokes, and then I like to think I'm still that age when it comes to different physical activities and then pay <laughs> for it the next day. But yes. I also think about when I was in middle school and I was five foot nine and weighed a buck 60 and I was the biggest kid in the class and clumsy tripping all over myself wearing the giant flannel shirts and had the long stringy like Kurt Cobain style hair and nice. I don't want to say <laughs> I was the poster child of someone who got bullied but I did get picked on quite a bit and nobody would mess with me because I was a foot taller than everybody else but not exactly a time in my life I really would want to go back to I, yeah I relate a, to that I, I relate to I, not not the hair but I, I definitely relate to uh just, just the, the, it was a brutal time. Middle, I think that's part of why I wanted to be a middle school educator right. is because it was just so hard. I think there was so much going on and, and, you know, I just, I, I felt like I was in trouble every day in middle school. I was that kid that um, just kind of struggled in the classroom and at home. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I, and I, and, and you know, and I talk to people and I think that is a very common theme. Like, I, it is funny because when I talk to different people, I'm like, nobody ever goes, man, middle school was the best. No one says. That's why there's no middle school reunions. Um, That's right. <laughs> but I will say that like people who go into middle school totally get that. And then I, I do think it's such a, I mean, I think about my own kids going through middle school and how awkward and weird that was for them. And like, yeah, it's, again, I applaud people that take that role on it's it's gnarly but so like that's your day job but you got like some uh some other stuff so tell us a little about like what what makes you tick man what are you passionate about yeah so i've been a counselor for 20 years um all at the middle school um but i've also had a chance to start doing speaking and and some coaching and uh you know some things where i get to help other schools and districts around the country uh mm -hmm. really create these uh 
you know, exceptional learning environments. And recently I wrote a book called award-winning culture. Um, so that's super fun. I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit. Um, and then I also am privileged to be the director of culture for the teach better team. And I don't know if you guys are familiar much with, uh, the work that teach better does, but they're, they're really doing some amazing cutting edge things to support educators all around the world at this point. So that's a really like, just just powerful experience to be a, a part of that and and such a dynamic team of of other educators that are positive and passionate about you know right. what they're doing every day so a lot of fun definitely definitely uh busy i, I feel like you know it, i was talking to somebody not not too long ago and they were you know asking me kind of my role and, and who i am and it's like man i feel like that's changing almost on a daily basis right especially with the times we're in <laughs> Oh yeah. It's a, it's just a wild, wild time right now. And uh, you know, I just, not that history books so much are going to be around in 50 years because of just the way things are shifting in that regard. But I just, I I'm almost looking forward to that 50 years from now to see how the history of this time is really going to be portrayed or whatever. So really like the last five years. So I don't want to get into politics at all, but it's been a wild ride politically the last few years too. I'm just, it's going to be interesting to see what the history books are saying about this time in, in 50 years or so. But um, now a while back, we had a guest on the show, Brand Fennel, uh, that mm-hmm. talked, did a little bit uh, speaking about the teach better team, but we, we didn't get a whole mm-hmm. lot into that. And then I feel like every time I'm on Twitter, there's some other name that I'm starting to learn like, Oh, they're affiliated with the teach better team. And then right. Che and Pav of the staff room podcast mm-hmm. there, there's a lot of connection with them on there as well. So talk to us a little bit about like, what exactly yeah. is the teach better team? So we can just finally get it out there. What exactly is it? Yeah. Who you are, what you do? Yeah. So teach better um, really started with Chad Ostrowski and Jeff Gargas. Uh, they kind of created something called the grid method, which is like a mastery learning framework. Mm-hmm. Um, to really empower students to sort of take ownership uh, over their learning. And from that, they started bringing in other people and, and the, the team sort of grew into uh, other avenues where they were, you know, doing other kinds of speaking and professional development. Um, now they're putting out like daily blogs and podcasts and uh, they have online courses and it's, it's, you know, really become quite, you know, a, a, you know, a powerhouse uh, in education. It's, it's, you know, pretty amazing. And so they reached out to me about a year ago and were like, Hey, you know, we want you to be a part of this. And, um, so I've had a chance to kind of, you know, be working with them now for, um, almost a year, I guess, um, close to that. Um, and it's just, it's such an uplifting group of people that they're, you know, basically committed to, you know, connecting, uh, supporting and inspiring educators everywhere. So, they really want no educator to feel like they're on an Island by themselves. I I think that would be kind of the underlining why of what's happening at teach better and uh, really just trying to change the way that education looks and feels. And so I I love being a part of it. Yeah. They have like a ton of, of resources I know and, and, and people connected within that, I know there, there's a bunch of podcasts, people that, that Kyle and I've had on the show, but then other people, Adam Welcome, I know does something with them. So, and then, so then you're, you're part of that network, but then you also are doing the award-winning culture, which is, is kind of your, your brand, I would say, like, like, tell us a little bit about, about, about like that piece. Yeah. So, you know, award-winning culture really began uh, probably about five years ago. Um, we started getting people that were reaching out from other schools, other districts and wanting to know, um, you know, kind of what was so special that was happening at enterprise. We had companies that were reaching out that we were using their products and, and seeing, you know, really amazing results. We had school leaders and districts reaching out. And so my role as the counselor, my wife works at the same school. She was the leadership uh, teacher for a long time. So the two of us had a pretty big part in what was happening, uh, for our school culture. And as people started reaching out and they, you know, would ask us questions or want us to come, you know, talk to their staff or whatever. Um, it really forced us to look internally and try to tease out like, what is the secret sauce here? Like what's so different. 
And so we started writing about it and, you know, that kind of led to some speaking opportunities and then eventually, um, you know, kind of a multiple book series. Okay. Um, and so that's been fun. My book just came out award-winning culture. Jen's right. actually writing the sequel to that, which is specific to teachers. So how do you take these big okay. ideas that are in, you know, my book and then relate that into the specific classroom and that'll come out, I think in the spring. So that'll be okay. really cool. And then we'll have a third book after that, but yeah, I mean, it's funny cause I, I never saw myself as a writer. I never expected uh, to write a book. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I guess, uh, I don't know, we just don't plan these things. Do I mean, you guys probably didn't, you guys probably didn't plan to do a podcast 10 years ago, but you know, it's like, whatever happens, there's that, that shift in, in the earth. And it's like, all of a sudden that's the path you're on. And, and I found it to be super awesome, um, to be able to inspire, you know, other people Mm -hmm. around uh, the country. So, you know, my book basically is like a school-wide framework, um, to take okay. intentionality and action and really infuse that into the daily fabric of the school. So there's kind of the three big pillars, there's character, there's excellence, and there's community. And so mm-hmm. character being, will you do the right thing? Mm-hmm. Excellence being, will you do your very best? And community being, what will you do for others today? Those are kind of our three things at our school. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, all of that breaks into an acronym that I go through in the book, but um, it's been really fun. It's been really, really interesting to see the reactions and, and the feedback from educators all around. So then, so then your, your book is really more like what you're describing. It's more that global perspective within a whole building. Like, how are we building this, this culture for students, staff, and all those? Correct? Right. Like, how are we serving okay. the whole child? Right. I think okay. that's, that's really what it gets to. Um, yeah. It's, it's kind of that big picture. Well, it has a lot of parallels, it sounds like, to another uh, individual, Ron Clark. He's got his 50 things or whatever. But to me, yours mm-hmm. sounds like it's I, I don't want to say the same thing, but it sounds similar. But it also it sounds like it's more minute and simplified, something mm-hmm. that can be implemented a lot easier than 50 things that you need to. do. And, and by no means am I trying to disparage the work of Ron Clark or anything, but right. that, that could be a, a lot to bite off and chew if you're starting out trying to build a culture somewhere. So I've read right. that book before. And to me, that's intimidating. Whereas it sounds like yours sounds a little bit more simplified. Am I, am I wrong? Yeah. 50 sounds like a lot to me, but <laughs> I, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure it's good. I'm sure it's really good. But what I would say is um, it, my book is, what I hope readers take away is a mindset towards intentionality because, Mm -hmm. you know, the reality is anything that we pick apart. And then, and that's what I do in the book is I just, you know, I literally pick everything apart in the book that you can imagine that relates to schools um, and, and sort of put through that lens of intentionality. So, Mm -hmm. okay. Parent teacher conferences, how could that look different? Assemblies, how could that look Mm -hmm. different? Morning announcements, how could that look different? Like, how do we take, you know, ideas like character, social, emotional learning, right. Mm -hmm. And infuse that into everything we do. Because I I think nowadays we know, you know, the average student today has as much anxiety as the average psychiatric patient of the 1950s, right. That means like most kids that are walking around would have been hospitalized for how they're feeling on the inside. Mm -hmm. So we know that the research says, kids need to be supported, right? I mean, academics Mm -hmm. matter, but we also have to be serving that whole kid. We have to see them as a human being, not just, you know, a transactional grade student kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I think, I I hope that comes across uh, in the book as far as, yeah, it is approachable. It is uh, doable. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I want people to feel like, you know, creating an amazing culture within their sphere, whatever that is, right? Whether that's, mm-hmm. you know, a classroom basis or the library, or maybe they're a coach and they have 10 players on their team, whatever that space is that they have influence, that they have the ability to create an award-winning environment in that space. Well, and I, and I think you talk about intentionality. I think and we've talked about this. I mean, there's a lot of things we do in education because we've always done them. And like you ask people, why are we doing this? And they're like, because we always did this. Well, what's your intention? Yeah. I don't know, because we always do this. So I, I think intentionality is huge. Like what is, what are you hoping to get out of, what's your outcome, I guess? 
Right. Yeah. Like, you know, a lot of it comes down to purpose, doesn't it? You know, right. my, I always tell people my why is, you know, I believe that education at its highest level is about inspiring others to discover mm-hmm. and develop their joy. And I use the word joy specifically, not happiness, but real sustainable purpose. Um, I think that should be what every school is, is focused on, you know, not just can I get them ready for this test or the next grade level or the next thing down, you know, the next week or whatever. It really is about, you know, how do I inspire them to get so passionate about something that they want to go learn about it? Right. And this becomes the thing that they want to spend their life doing. Well, and I can imagine that a lot of the ideas from the book uh, have really been born out of the conversations that you get to have with students on a regular basis, because as a counselor, you're in a unique position, whereas Mm -hmm. teachers and even administrators that we don't get to have conversations with students like a counselor does. So I can imagine a lot of that came from that whole intentionality and, and addressing the needs of the whole child really came out of your experience as a counselor. Yeah, that's, that's certainly true. Um, and I, I would say I, I, I relish my role as a counselor, but I've also sort of redefined, um, how I see a counselor. So for instance, one of the things that I write about in my book is we created a student led leadership podcast where kids can do, uh, interviews, um, with, you know, experts, authors, speakers, professional athletes all over the world, and then reflect on those interviews and share those out. Mm. And if, if we do that in a really intentional way, we can actually change the school culture within our building. So we've had the opportunity to have kids, you know, talk to an anxiety expert or an expert mm-hmm. on parenting or an expert on servant leadership or, you know, whatever the subject matter might be. And then they share their learnings, those reflections. We call them a debrief, but we share those out for uh, you know all the other students to be impacted by that learning experience. And it's, it's been, you know, it's just one example, but it's been you know super powerful to be hands on with that, as opposed to a counselor. A lot of times would be sort of removed, right? Mm-hmm. I've been able to get in there with leadership kids and actually lead that process with them. So that's that's been super rewarding for me. Well, and I have to imagine that that work that you you've started and have done, I, I, I would imagine in our current situation, our current environment, you're seeing maybe the benefits of, of having that culture, because I, I, I don't know as far as like how your district's working. I know some districts are distance learning, some are face to face, but I got to imagine, at least in my experience, kids got a lot of anxiety. Adults got a lot of anxiety and it is now amplified because of this current situation. I mean, are you seeing, yeah. are you seeing that in your situation? Yeah. I mean, anxiety's out, uh, out of bounds right now. I mean, I, I, you know, I read you off that statistic. Um, mm-hmm. that's what the research says that was all pre COVID. Now they did a right. big study in May and found that all of the things that we know, anxiety, suicide risk, depression mm-hmm. have all elevated since then. Um, one in three parents right now are dealing with anxiety. I mean, that's, that's what, that's the world we're living in. Right. So, um, what we found last spring when we, you know, basically were locked out of the school, like most everybody else around the country, um, when we were forced remote, um, we found that we were in a lucky spot because we had done that groundwork. We had, Mm -hmm. we had created those relationships. We had that culture in place. We had those norms and, and, you know, kind of that, that, uh, I don't know that foundational, my, my buddy says that, uh, John Norlin, I don't know if you guys know John, but he's got a saying that he says, um, uh, social emotional learning and, and whole child work is not another thing on the plate. He says it is the plate. Mm-hmm. It, it is actually the foundation that everything else rests on. And I think, you know, we had that solid plate and then COVID hit. And so I, I think that kind of helped us to be ahead of the curve a little bit. Um, now this year we started remote again. And so mm-hmm. now we're in a new state, right? Where we're, we're, we're trying to learn the, how do we, you know, adapt some of these things that, um, were super successful in person. How do we adapt those to, uh, this virtual world? And so that's a challenge, you know, and, and we're taking that challenge on and, and learning every day. <laughs> yeah. I think what helped out when this happened last spring, back in March was at least in my classroom, my perspective, 
the transition wasn't so bad because my co-teachers and I, we, we knew our kids and we had a relationship with our kids. So that transition wasn't bad. Fast forward to August, I'm in a brand new school and I'm returning to a district that I was in for a long time. So I was familiar with the situation, but mm-hmm. it, it was 450 miles away from where I had been the previous two years. So now I'm walking into a 100% remote situation where I don't know any of these kids. I don't know who I'm even working with outside of the handful of conversations we had via Google Meet or Zoom ahead of time. And then trying to build up that same thing that we had going on previously. And I will say, I I, I have doubts about myself right now, at this moment right now, because we're a semester done. I mean, we're, our, we have two quarters of the school year done at this point and 90% of my kids, if they walked up to me in a store right now, I would have no idea who they are because I don't see them on a regular basis. I, I may have seen their school picture from last year. That's on the student information system or whatever. Um, interacting is so tough because of the situation. And part of me understands why kids don't want to get on and interact. I, I get it. But it's yeah. also frustrating at the same time. That's a conversation for another day. But uh, it's just, I, I really look forward to the day when we can get back in person. But I also want it to be done safely at the same time. And as we're recording this right now, this is definitely not the time to be going back, especially where I'm at right now, where we went from 400 cases a day throughout the entire state to now we're like 3,000 just in the city of Las Vegas alone. It's insanity right now. That is crazy. Yeah, we're still full remote uh, secondary, but uh, we've we've we got part of elementary back, and uh, we're able to bring in some handfuls of students for tutoring and things. Mm-hmm. So that's nice because you know there's some of those high at risk students that you know mm-hmm. you like need to get out and like support. So we're able to to do some of that, but it, it definitely doesn't feel real yet, right? It doesn't feel like it's school. Mm-hmm. Well, and I, I think you made a great point about that, that, that whole, that the SEL, the whole child, that piece, the, the soft skills, whatever you want to call them like, as non-academics, that is the thing. And I wonder, we talk a lot on this show about like, like what, through all this, through COVID 2020, what are the, what are the positive things that have come out of this? And I think that also is one of those things. It's like, I'm, I'm hopeful that as a system, we now are like, okay, Everybody was like, oh yeah, we do SEL. Yeah, okay, yeah. I have, my, my teacher does an SEL lesson maybe once a week. Now it's like, if you don't have this, like, and I tell my teachers this all the time, we're face-to-face. But at any moment, I tell them, we go out tomorrow. Who knows what's going to happen? I, I mean, you know, that's just kind of the reality we live in. So we better have really great relationships with our kids because this is the one chance that we have. We know we have them face-to-face. So I'm hopeful in the future that people begin to realize that. Yeah, me too. I, I, it feels like this is an opportunity, you know, Mm -hmm. as much as, you know, it's easy to look at this all as such a negative and, and there's a lot of negative uh, (laughs) that we can see. Right. I I hope that you're right. I hope that people now can start to value, um, you know, really looking at, at kids in their holistic way, right. Like, Mm and, and how are we going to support them beyond academics? Um, yeah, I, I, I think I, I, I see a lot of educators around the country that are starting to get pretty good at these like check-ins, right? Like, right. you know, whether it's Google form kind of check-in or whether it's just mm-hmm. like a morning meeting type thing, depending on the, the level that they're working. Um, I think the 2.0 version of that is for educators to start getting vulnerable with their students. So, you know, you guys were talking earlier about, you know, not necessarily feeling like you're doing your best job, right? You know, mm-hmm. not, not just feeling like you're, you're sort of just surviving, which I think almost every educator out there that's listening to this can identify right. and resonate with. Right. I think, you know, if we can get to a point where we're being open and honest and authentic with our kids, I think that's the bridge to some of those connections. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you guys were talking about, well, wow, maybe I pass them, you know, in the store, I might, maybe not even know who they are. I think just, you know, being a real person is going to go so far in this kind of environment. Mm-hmm. So that would, that would be my pushback to that is, you know, how do you now take it to that next level where, you know what, it, this is tough. Like, I don't, right. this isn't how I want to be a teacher. This, you know, this is, right. this is brutal. Like, uh, you know, 
I was grading papers until, you know, middle of the night, right. Or whatever it was and just be real with them uh, in those moments. I think that that allows kids the opportunity to, um, you know, kind of open up to you guys, right. As mm-hmm. educators. Well, no, I, and another I, thing is just that self-care piece too. And Ben, you and I have had guests on, we've talked about this too, yeah. is where we got to take care of ourselves as well. So even before COVID, I know I wanted to start kind of pulling back on a few things because I just had so many irons in the fire. And, and now with COVID, it's really just made it that much worse. And I couldn't even imagine where I'd be right now if I had not pulled back before COVID hit. But I'm starting, I'm reassessing again, what can I do right now to really pull back a little bit and give myself a little bit more time, give myself a little bit more grace on some things and whatnot. And then I I've gotten into the habit now of walking every day again. It was something that I've always been a physical person. I, you know, played different sports growing up, but as you get older, the bones creak a little bit more. We get that. So I played football for 11 years. So never had problems with the knees, but the knee problems are starting to creep up now after the pounding they took for so long. And one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of people will make when they start to try to become active is they try to do too much. So, and, and I've been guilty of this where it's like, Hey, I'm going to train for a half marathon, even though I haven't run in three years or something like that. Okay. Terrible idea. But I have made a habit now, like I said, of walking every day, three to five miles. And it's like, it's a part of me now. And I feel great. Even on the days where I'm like, man, do I really want to go do this? Yes, I absolutely do. Because it gets me outside away from my computer, whatever I can throw in, listen to some music. And it's, uh, it's great. You get to discover new music you haven't listened to in forever. So so it's not really new at that point. Uh, So because I always find myself just picking a favorite band and hitting the hitting the station on YouTube music and listen, all sorts of great stuff. And then you just, I get out there hour, hour and a half, and then I'm home and, and it's great. And I just, more teachers, we, we need to realize we got to do that for ourselves. Even if it's just getting out for a half an hour, not the hour and a half, like I, I try to do. Yeah. I relate so much to what you just said. I, I played basketball for years and have uh, lower back issues and a knee issue and, and had to quit a few years back and basically kind of had to pivot towards uh, dog walks. And so that's, that's become my habit. My wife and I, we take our dogs on a pretty good size morning walk uh, every day. And we've done that for a number of years. So I don't even feel human until I get that in in the morning. So uh, I think you're right. I think yeah. that self-care piece is huge. Well, and I always laughed at the people that got into the Apple watch challenge with the little rings that turn color and the more steps you get. I have an Android, so I got the Google fit app, but now that, now that I see that on the Google fit app, I'm like, Oh, I didn't get a check Mark today. I, it's, it's, it's eight 30. I got to get outside and get another 5,000 steps in. Let's go. Gamification. <laughs> yes. Well, and I think, I, and I think, I think one thing that we, that, that we don't talk about a lot is I, I and is I think that people, well, as educators, we get energy from kids. So when you're in a building with kids, you pick up energy. And, and the classic one is you cannot, like I can tell you, I knew exactly when I was going to get sick. I would get sick as soon as the break started because I would have kids and you'd just be like, I got to go and we're doing stuff and you're in that zone. And then all of a sudden it's like your body just shuts down. And I worry about educators now because this format while, while I've seen two people do amazing things with connecting with kids through this, some of my, some of our students do so well in this format. It, it is, it is their jam, but I worry that like they're missing that, that face-to-face energy that, that you get. And I think for teachers, that's one of the things that's kind of weighing on them. And it might be, some might know it, some might not. So yeah, Kyle, I would agree with you. It's like, go find something to like, that is separate from this. That's the other thing. Working from home. I, I know teachers are doing this. All of a sudden they're like, I'm working at seven o'clock at night. I'm like, why are you doing that? Because well, you're in your house. And to piggyback what Hans, you were saying a little bit ago about being vulnerable with your kids, share that with your kids too right. about, Absolutely. hey, you know what? I went and walked five and a half miles yesterday. And guess what I saw on that walk? I saw X, yeah. Y, and Z or something like that. Share that with them. It's not, That part's not necessarily being vulnerable. It's just being a human. 
at that point. So, and that's just going to build that relationship with your kids that much more, especially if you're in that remote environment, like I am, uh, like you are Hans, Ben, you've been going to that off and on now for months between first it was fires, then it was COVID. And then it was back to fires again and all sorts (laughs) of things. So, but just being a human, something we all got to do. And there's a lot of teachers out there that really struggle with that. I'm curious to see too, you guys were, were kind of both talking a little bit about it, but I'm curious to see what, what positivities come out of this as far as changes. Mm-hmm. You know, we talked about the whole child piece, but like, even just like, you know, empowering kids, you know, like you can't really like when you're doing remote learning, instruction doesn't look like it did when you were in the classroom, right? You, you've already had to make changes. And I, and you know, you guys were saying there's some people that, uh, it's actually working for, right? Like mm-hmm. there's, there are kids that it's like, this is kind of working for that kid. Maybe not, you know, these other kids, but right. I I'm curious to see what elements once we get back to our new normal, like kind of stick, you know what I mean? Right. What do you guys I, think? Uh, no. And I've, I've told my teachers and the teachers that I work with. So I have, my kids are, my elementary kids are face-to-face, but I have about a third, probably about 130, 140 kids that are remote, that are doing distance learning. So I have four teachers that just teach distance. And I've told all my teachers, I said, I, like, I, I, said, I don't know what next year is going to look like, but I can tell you right now, it is never going to look like two years ago. There is no way. I think, I think you're going to have families that this format works for them. I think here's my thing is I think teachers have had to get really good at engaging kids because now I have to engage you while you're in your house, while you have another (laughs) screen that's playing Fortnite while you're doing like, you know, I mean, how many of us I've, I would totally be like, I'm super good at putting my phone under the camera so that I can like go, okay, I'm going to answer my email while I'm in this meeting. So like, I, I, I'm with you. I'm curious to see like how we, I'm, I hope we don't go back to, okay, we're back. Everything's going to look normal. Here's a textbook and we're going to well, do I, six. Yeah. Hours. I don't think I we know. can. I, I don't think we can go back to that normal because kids are different, right? I mean, they, right. they won't have been in like a traditional classroom right. in such a long period of time. It's like, they're not the same kinds of kids. <laughs> like it's, right. it's just the game yeah. has changed. Right. right. I think about like kinder, my kindergartners this year, that are doing remote learning and they're going to come back and be like, they're going to be like first grade and you're in a classroom and you're going to have to sit there for the entire time. Mm, that's going to be hard. Yeah. And I don't know. Yeah. Well, and I, I'm already hearing rumblings from various educators uh, that colleagues and then across the Twitterverse or whatever that, man, I can't wait till we go back to face to face. So I don't have to use canvas or Google classroom or whatever anymore. Like, why, why did you yeah. spend all that time learning how to use it and then not be able to use it when you go face to face? If anything, it's going to make your life that much easier because you already know how to use it. Mm-hmm. So that part really frustrates me. And then, well, but the special ed teacher in me, I'm stoked for when we return face to face because no longer do I have to haggle schedules for IEPs because it is, <laughs> it is so impossible sometimes to get a parent to leave work to come for an IEP. And I get it, especially if a parent is living paycheck to paycheck. I have to ask them to leave work two hours to come in for an IEP. That's terrible. But now because of Google meet, because of zoom, whatever it may be, you can hold these things. That parent doesn't have to leave work. They just need to dip into the back room for 15 minutes, get the IEP done and then be right back at work and not have to miss anything that's there. And so that part, that was something I wish we, I tried to do, prior to that i would hold an ip by phone occasionally but my old right. school insisted on face-to-face ones but why but now it can be done absolutely right. i I'm, and i'm curious about like like reimagining the entire the school day so i think about like okay why is it that kids have to go to school from nine to three like mm-hmm. i don't i mean i'm curious i i tell my teachers and i i say it half jokingly as i'm like no kid is not getting into harvard because of 2020. I'm sorry. It's not, this isn't, <laughs> I, I value what we do. And I think it's the most important thing in the world. But at the end of the day, I'm like, mm, kids are pretty resilient. They're going to, if, if you prevent, provide them with, with interesting things that build their passion, they're going to learn. It's just, that's, and you engage them. Well, and I, so, I think we all have to remember that this pandemic happened to all of us. 
Like, you know what I mean? It's right. not like this just hit Nevada, right? Or just Washington, no. Eastern Washington. It's like right. everybody is dealing with this. So kids are going to be where they are, right. you know? <laughs> and, and who knows that this is like a, a, a good, I, I mean, we talked about this. One of the things I noticed was in my, so I live in the neighborhood where my school is. And I noticed like as, especially last year. So you would see kids at home, at, like with their family, going for walks, going for bike rides, kids eating dinner. Cause like all use, I mean, at my school, especially kids are over, over um, scheduled. Like I got kids that play travel baseball, all sure. these things. And you're like, okay, everybody just needs to calm down and just do like a, a, a worldwide reset on what's truly important. So I'm with you, Hans. I'm, I'm super curious about what positive, I would love to hear from other people. Like what are, you know, what are these future thinkers thinking, you know, people that predict these things, what, what is going to be the big change? Like what's education going to look like next year? I don't know. I think we're going to have to be intentional about it though, because I, I, I think you guys are right. I think there's going to be a a population of not just educators, but, but, you know, parents and, and even kids that are going to be, okay, let's get back to normal life. Right. And it's like, no, 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 it's a new, new normal now. I mean, right. <laughs> it's, it's right. not the same normal. <laughs> so yeah, I, 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 I like the idea, you know, when we think about intentionality, it really starts with just that, that pause, which I heard both of right. you guys say it at, at various points. It's like, let's get mindful. Let's step back, mm -hmm. you know, um, let's, let's, let's decide what's most important here because you can't be really that intentional if you're stretched really thin, right? right? You, you have to kind of drill down and go, this is what matters to me. This is what, mm -hmm. what I'm going to put my energy and my time on. And I think schools collectively, right. As a system need to be doing that same kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be interesting to say the least. So uh, once we get through this and, you know, we're recording this beginning of December, it's January by the time we're posting this. So who knows where we're even at a month from now when we're recording, but I, I, I hate to be the uh, the pessimist, but I, I don't see things getting that much better with the situation over this next month. And my kids are asking me in classes almost every day, do you think we're going back to school anytime soon? And I tell them straight up, I don't think we're going back this year, guys and gals. It's just, mm -hmm. I just don't see it happening. But mm -hmm. Hans, like you said, as soon as we do go back to the quote unquote, the new normal, it has to be intentional. We have to really take what we learned over this whole year, year and a half, whatever it ends up being and really apply that to what we're going to be doing. Because right. the worst thing we could do is just revert back to what it was before. Right. And like, you, you basically, it'd be like building a skyscraper and then, oh, there's a broken window on the top floor, tear the whole thing down. Well, and, and, and I, I will just speak from a school that is face to face in this, in this, and we'll, we'll take out masks and social distancing and all the, you know, all that stuff. But I, one of the things that I talk, we talk about as a school, and I know in my entire district, cause we're, we're face to face, um, is a t intentionality, Hans, and you said it right there. Like, so and just a small example of that is we talk about um, standards. So the essential standards, like what is it that kids have to know in this grade level? What is the most important thing when they that you want them to know it when they move on? And I've talked with my teachers about this. There's no time now to go, we're gonna do everything. What is the most important thing? What do you like? Cause I tell them, you don't know our, our time is a gift right now. And so let's just like focus on that. But again, it goes back to what are we being intentional about academically, but then also back to that SEL piece, back to building culture. I mean, we spent the first, I mean, the first month in our building, just talking about rebuilding the culture of the school because yeah. kids have been gone. And I, I think the schools are going to have, when they come back, that's got to be the number one thing. I'm curious, what do you what do you guys see is what holds teachers back right now from, you know, being able to really drill down on what's most essential as far as standards, because I see that in our building. I mean, I, I see that across, you know, our district. I see that, you know, with educators that I'm connected to all over uh, the place that uh, there's it's like they're holding on very tightly to these standards that it's like, no, they're all important. 
And I love what you just said about, you know, you're trying to take your staff from, okay, yeah, I know you feel like they're all important, but let's, right. let's really narrow it down. Like, what do you, what is the holdup, do you think, from t- the teacher side of that? Me personally, I think it's a, it's a hangover from NCLB. It's no child left behind. It's that yeah. fear of like, I'm graded on a test and this yeah. one shot deal and I got a like shotgun approach yeah. or else I failed my kids. And yeah. um, so I always joke about like my first year teaching was a kindergarten teacher. So I'm a kindergarten teacher. Like I'm like, I taught, I did student teaching in fourth grade. I'm like, sweet, I can do kindergarten. I, I had a kindergartner at home. I'm like, I will totally say I like made some stuff up. We did some stuff. So like fast forward, cause I've been doing this a while. And then, you know, you always go, I'm like, man, I think I might've screwed some kids up. But I will say like, I have a, there's a principal in my district whose daughter was in my kindergarten class. And then I had her in first and she's gone on to college and got a college degree. And then I, I think she's getting veterinary medicine. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, all right, I did okay. I'm like, I didn't mess up. And I think that's, I think it's a fear and Kyle, you wrote a whole book about this. It's that fear of failure Mm. is kind of where I think it comes from. Like it's fear of taking a risk. Well, it's the fear of failure, the fear of taking a risk, but it's also trying to make the situation comfortable by relying Mm -hmm. on what people know. So what we did before, whether it worked or not, what people were comfortable with, they're just trying to transition it into this current situation. And it's just, it's just not feasible. So, mm-hmm. I mean, the the people that have, say you've got an hour block of time with your students on a Google Meet and you spend 55 of it basically talking to the kids. I mean, mm-hmm. doing that in a regular classroom is not a great idea. And then you're trying to do it on a computer screen right. and then wondering why the students aren't interacting and why they're not doing stuff. Uh, that part's frustrating. And and I mean, there's parts of me that I, I'm not perfect either. I'm not like the most revolutionary teacher in the world where I'm doing all these great things and my kids are interacting left and right. Mm-hmm. So I struggle with the interaction piece myself and I struggle with teaching in different ways based on this. But I also can take comfort knowing that A, I'm trying to be better and B, I'm surrounded by people all over the place that are going to support me in mm-hmm. trying new things as well. So but uh, again, there's just, there's so many people out there because what they know and what they're comfortable with, they have a hard time breaking away. And again, that fear of failure, like you said, right. Ben. Yeah, and I, I think it's so important for the educational leaders to really model that, that uh, you know, brave risk-taking, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're going to learn together, right? We're, we're going to mm-hmm. get through this uh, and learn on the fly and, and build the airplane in the air and all those analogies that we've heard over the last right. nine months that it's, it's like, yeah, we can do this, but you know, uh, we've got to, we've got to take some things off the plate, right. Mm-hmm. And, and decide what's critical and, and what we need to focus on. Um, and, and what I'm seeing around where I am is it, it's really taking leaders, you know, directly saying to teachers, you know, just relax. Like mm-hmm. you don't need to get to that. You know, we don't, right. we don't need to hit that standard. It's okay. Like they're going to be okay. Like let's, let's focus on what you want to focus on and do a good job with it, but don't mm-hmm. feel like you have to do everything that, you know, you know what I mean? Like you, right. it's, it's just impossible. Well, so. And I think it, and I think it also take, like you talked about with teachers being vulnerable, I think it takes leaders being vulnerable and being okay with saying to their teachers or their staff or whoever they are, you know, whoever they work with and say, like, I, you're right. This is, this is nuts. I'm not really sure what's going to happen. Like, we're going to do some stuff. I was, you know, I used to joke, kids are going to show up. We're going to do some stuff. Kids will leave. They're happy. If they're tired, I'm extra happy because you made them tired. You know, <laughs> kids need to be tired, not teachers. That's my like, but, right. but I do, I think you're right. I think it's going to be, it's going to take, it's, it's all of us. And I think, I don't know. I don't know about you guys. I feel like, I feel like this is not definitely not what I went to college for to become a teacher. Like, so I think everybody needs to acknowledge that, that, Hey, we're all first year. Everybody's first year. I don't mm-hmm. care if you're a superintendent all the way down to, you know, the lunch lady, the guy driving, the, everybody, it's your first year. So relax. Yeah. Somebody asked me a while back, you know, like, okay, as a counselor, like, what are you doing? How, do, how does that look? Like, what do you, 
you know, how are you, how you working with kids and stuff? And, and I, and I don't remember uh, my exact answer, but it was, you know, pretty much the same kind of thing. Like, Hey, I didn't go to school for this. You know, I, I went and got a master's in counseling and this didn't come up once. <laughs> like, there's, no, there's no chapter in the book that said pandemic. I missed that section. <laughs> I just, yeah. So I think, you know, we're all just doing the best we can. I think. Yeah. <laughs> That's it, man. Well, Hans, you've got lots yes. of different resources yes. out there in the world and lots of different ways that people connect with you. So share with the listeners where we can connect with you, websites, social media, all the above. Yeah. So my book, Award Winning Culture, is available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and uh, as well as on our website, uh, which is awardwinningculture.com. Mm-hmm. And like I said earlier, we're doing speaking and coaching and, and working with uh, individual schools and districts all over the country. Um, so we'd love to support people. I'm really active on uh, Twitter and Instagram. So that's a great way to connect as well. My, my handle is Hans N Apple and I spell Apple weird. It's A-P-P-E-L. Um, but yeah, I love, love talking to people, anything to do with school culture and, and really serving the whole child. So I really appreciate you guys having me on the show. Oh, it's been awesome how I was talking yeah. to you for almost the last hour or so here. Say. So I just looked at the clock and realized how much time went by. And so, wow, that did not feel like that at all. So, you know, it's a good conversation when that happens. Yep. <laughs> or sure. a good beer, right? I mean, there whatever. Go. There's always that <laughs> too. So. Yes. so, well, awesome. So now listeners, please keep this yes. conversation going. Share some of your thoughts on today's topics. Email us at info at beeredupodcast.com. Tweet us at Beer Edu Pod. Use Beer Edu Pod as the hashtag as well. Hit us up on Facebook at Beer Edu Podcast. That's all one word. Follow us on Instagram at Beer Edu Pod. YouTube channel. So we're trying to get some stuff out there a little bit more. We keep yep. talking about doing some beer tastings on YouTube. And well, we just have not done that yet. We have to though. <laughs> There's so, a holiday coming up. We'll take care of it then. Yeah, we might be able to do that. So you'll maybe you'll see some of those videos before you hear us talking about how we're not doing them. So who knows? <laughs> so, but our YouTube channel is bit.ly slash beer edu YouTube. Follow Hans at Hans N Apple on Twitter. Voice message on the Anchor app. Leave us a review wherever you listen so more can find the show. And Ben, if people want to be a guest on the show yep. like Hans, what do they do? Yeah, so just go to our website, beeredupodcast.com. You click on that contact and subscription info link, uh, complete the guest form, and then you're in the queue. And then the other thing is we have to really thank School Rubric for featuring the Beer Absolutely. EDU podcast. Um, you know, the mission of School Rubric is to help schools, educators, parents, and students help tell their stories so that stakeholders can make the best choices about enrollment and staffing. Learn more at schoolrubric.com, and you can find all kinds of great content um, from educators all over the world. And Hans, we'd love to have you stick around because this is the next part where, uh, Kyle, you are going to uh, do a little bit of teaching. Yes, indeed. So this was a fun one to uh, look at because I actually thought we did this one before and we didn't. No, this we're this gonna, wasn't one of those make, situations. On, we're going to make a drinking game out of like how many times <laughs> we say, I think we've done this before. How have we not done this before? No, this time it wasn't so much of a like, how have we not done this one? But I honestly thought we had, and that's why I never looked it up. And then I did the uh, control F search on the spreadsheet. I'm like, oh, we did not do this one. I guess we kind of dropped the ball on this one here. So, <laughs> but um, we're going to take a look at what the dunkle is. So, but now if you are a listener of the show and you're thinking, wait a second, back on episode 68, I re- I distinctly remember listening to that episode. You covered this one. <laughs> No, we covered the Dunkel Weissen on that episode, so which was the dark version of the Hefeweizen. So now a we Dunkel, just got all sorts of crazy like out there into like oh, the beer universe. I I totally because I had the spreadsheet up when doing the research. I I am making references to past episodes right now because of that. There so, we go. Yeah. All right. So no, if I really remembered that, that'd be awesome. So we just got inner workings right there. So all right, <laughs> yeah. go ahead. Sorry for interrupting. No, no, it's all good. So. So a Dunkel is a German beer style. It is a lager, uh, much like most German beers are. Uh, Dunkel is the German word for dark. So it's basically a dark uh-huh. lager. Now, roasted malts are given it that darker color. Usually it's an amber to a reddish brown. Well, you might be thinking too, hey, didn't you cover a different German style on the podcast that was similar as well? 
We did on episode 42, we covered the Schwarz beer or black beer. But the difference yes. between a Dunkel and a Schwarz beer is that a Schwarz beer is black. And we're talking like really bold flavors like coffee and chocolate. Right. The Dunkel is not nearly as bold or nearly as dark. So if you want to learn more about Dunkel Weizen and for the Schwarz beer, go back to 68 and 42 respectively, and you can mm-hmm. learn more about those. So now with the Dunkel. Lager flavors of chocolate, bread crust, caramel. Okay, it's got mm-hmm. a nice clean finish to it. So this is a really good style of beer. I wish these were more yeah. readily available, by the way. ABVs that range from five to like six percent usually. IBUs okay. like 15 to 25, so not overly hopped. The the hop flavors are very subtle. And they use those noble hops that are very common mm-hmm. in most German styles. So very just a nice balanced hop. Um, this is right up your alley, uh, pairs very well with like roasted pork dishes and beef, Mm -hmm. uh, sausages and cheeses. So just a nice versatile beer, uh, to go with food. Um, examples, I'm going to butcher these because they're all German. Yep. Polliner, which is, uh, their Dunkel, Eyinger, Mm -hmm. their Altbitterisch Dunkel, which again, I don't speak German. So Lowenbrow's Dunkel, Spaten's München Dunkel. So I probably just mispronounced Munich in German too. So, but I'm going to be okay with that. And these are ones, because they're German beers, you're not just going to be able to go to the AMPM no. down the street and get them at the gas station. So your big box but, beer stores that you may or may not have near you, these are good places to go. They always right. have that, like the foreign beer section, and they yep. always have a large German selection. You can find a lot of these there. And that, yeah, because th- three of those I've had, and I've had them here, I've had them in the U.S., and I've also had them in Germany. So they, those are ones. Yeah, Spotten is pretty much. Though it's it's you can find that one pretty readily. Yeah, I agree. And the the Eyinger one is very easy to find too. Well, right. not I would not easy, but like again, if you have access to one of those big box uh, stores or like a specialty mm-hmm. bottle shop, you're going to be mm-hmm. able to find these. I remember there was a. It actually was a gas station where I went to college, but it was a specialty bottle shop slash gas station. They had the Iyengar beers at that one when I was in college back in the day. So, wow, you went to a Shui Shui college town, man. <laughs> uh, Northern Michigan <laughs> University, I, uh, where the N stands for knowledge. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> what town has gas stations that have German import, like, other than maybe Lowenbrow, like um, or Heineken? Upper <laughs> Michigan, where um, when it snows for eight months of the year, you got to have true. something to keep you warm. <laughs> okay, I, you got me there. No, and those, yeah, I would definitely, this is a great style that, that I think, I think is, is, is one of those ones we've talked about food pairing and it is definitely one that goes well with, with food. Yeah. I, the sm- I, I appreciate this one a lot that we have in Las Vegas, a uh, Hofbro house, which is modeled after the, the traditional Hofbro house in uh, mm-hmm. Munich. And yep. you go there and they've got the Oompa band. They've got the the uh, leader steins of beer and they have the Hofbro it's, Dunkel on tap there. Mm-hmm. You get a liter of that. And then I always, what I usually get when I go there is either the sausage sampler platter or yep. the uh, Wiener schnitzel, that nice, that fried pork tenderloin hammered out with mashed potatoes and sauerkraut. And you just, you can't go wrong with that, with that. Dunkel Those are making me hungry. Yeah. I'm going to need a, having, a second dinner here. Yeah. <laughs> well, and having, having been to that one in Vegas many times and then having been to several in Munich, I will tell you that one in Vegas is legit. They do a really good job of like, it looks like the real deal. Yeah, no, it's, that's a really fun place to go. And uh, they, unfortunately, because of COVID, it has been shut down because you yeah. definitely are not social distancing at no. a place like the Hofbrauhaus house, because <laughs> that is just like per you and strangers picnic you, tables. Yeah. Picnic <laughs> tables you sit with. And then when the band starts playing, you stand up with your steins with your arms around each other's shoulders. Yeah. You go, oh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, it's so much fun. So, so after, one day I'm going to go to Germany. Over, to too. <laughs> after this is over, man, I'll come down to Vegas. We'll go. Perfect. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> so, well, speaking of like German style names, Hans, thank you again yes. so much for joining us here. Yes. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on here to talk beer, to talk about just really all sorts of things. I think we solved some of the world's problems today. Absolutely. This was the highlight of my day, man. Come on. <laughs> well, we appreciate this is it. good hey, stuff. Hey, man, after after doing a bunch of podcasts, we really appreciate you like being on and like, and you brought it. You had some great so much stuff. Fun. And it, was, it was awesome to have you. So much yes, fun. I, I appreciate the work you guys are doing. 
Thank you. So next episode will be episode 94. And listeners, as always, until next time, may the malts and the hops be with you. Right on.